Hey, this is the interview part of the video. Can Wikipedia help offline reinforcement learning? If you haven't seen it, I've made a comprehensive review of this research paper in the previous video. So be sure to check that out. The authors that I speak to today are the authors of this paper. They've seen my review and they're ready to dive in and tackle all of my criticisms. It's a big privilege to have the authors on and to be able to ask them any questions. So please let me know how I'm doing. Let me know how I can improve these videos for you. And as always, if you like, leave a like and I'll see you around. Bye. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm here with Michelle Reed and Yutaro Yamada, who are the authors of the paper, Can Wikipedia Help Offline Reinforcement Learning? First of all, uh, both of you welcome and thank you very much for being here and discussing the paper with me. Thank you oh, for thanks having for inviting us. So I, I obviously, you know, the, the basic ideas of the paper I've, I've mentioned, what, what would interest me is just um, how would you pitch the paper if you had to pitch the paper, let's say someone comes up to you at a poster presentation or, or something like this, what would be your initial pitch, like whatever, 30 second or a minute, um, the basics of what you do? Uh, I'll give it a shot. Uh, let's see. So here um, in our paper, uh, we look at uh, seeing whether, say, Wikipedia or language pre-training uh, can help other sequence modeling tasks. And in this case, we focus on uh, offline reinforcement learning. And I found this to be personally like a pretty cool project because essentially um, the reasons are not completely clear, to be honest. Uh, but we see that with this language pre-training, we can actually get, see um, quite substantial gains in certain areas. Mm -hmm. um, over like regular, like random, random initialization. Um, and I think even more interesting is that it, uh, these models managed to converge faster, uh, which shows that there is some sort of information there that is helpful. And personally, um, I'm pretty interested in this line of research because it really begs the question, like how are these seemingly unrelated tests similar? Is there a way to see how similar they are and maybe even um, encourage like a new paradigm for transfer learning uh, where you don't even need like uh, conventionally related data. How did you, you mentioned it a little bit why it's interesting and I, I completely agree and the results are uh, astounding I would say. How did you get the idea to do this? Because initially if someone told me you know you just pre-train something on language and then use it for reinforcement learning or, or something like this you'd dismiss it quite quickly, let's say, of all the ideas that you could choose from. So how did you, like, did you have some indication that this could work or a hunch or did you just try it at some Saturday morning? Like, how, how did it come about? Uh, sort of a mix of all three. So like, to, to, like, I guess as a background, we have that, like, say, in multilingual learning, um, it's been demonstrated by a couple of papers now uh, that say you can transfer, like, an English bird to a Spanish um, BERT, for example, um, or you can like add new languages to, uh, to like say a model where it wasn't pre-trained on those languages. Um, or even there's like an experiment in the MBART paper, I think, where they have like this ablation where they pre-train on like six languages and then they test um, on like some unseen languages, if I remember correctly, and that works too. So like in the multilingual setting, um, this sort of intuition has been demonstrated, though you could argue like, oh, it's language um, to language. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I was talking with the other author uh, in this paper, Shane, uh, one day we were just chatting and we ended up talking about like pre-training for RL and I was like, oh, there's no pre-training for RL. Um, like they haven't had like their BERT moment or their GPT moment yet. Uh, mm -hmm. And we were discussing, um, he was like discussing the limitations and then I was like, why don't we try doing a language model? And then, yeah, and then it became sort of like the Saturday morning experimentation session, uh, which you like alluded to, which is like, I was like, that day I was like, okay, let me just try putting in a language model there and see what happens. And the initial results uh, were actually quite surprising in a good way. So we decided to continue doing that. Oh, I was going to just add on to like, I remember you, uh, Marshall was saying that she, when, 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 when Shen first when Shen's first reaction was like, "There's no way that's gonna work," like you know, that, that sort of, you know, like, <laughs> I, th I don't think he was really excited about the idea. But like, when when Michelle actually did experiment and showed the results, he was like, "Really, yeah, 
So I didn't even, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, the, the basic concept here is, I think it is very simple and therefore the sort of the setup of the paper is very simple, right? You pre-train on this, on this language modeling objective and you make a point that it is, um, the autoregressivity might be somewhat important right here in, in what you do. And then there is this decision transformer on the, uh, on the right hand side. Um, now did I, I don't know how much you've seen of my introductory video, but did I get anything wrong in the setup here? Or did you, did you want to highlight a specific part of this? Like why could language models be particularly useful for this kind of uh, reinforcement learning offline? offline reinforcement learning with decision transformers. Right. Uh, yeah, I think you captured it uh, pretty well. Um, I guess like we'll go deeper into like sort of maybe the reasons why this could work as we go deeper into the questions, but like as like a high level idea. Yeah, um, I think you captured it pretty well. Um, I, I was always just maybe as, as a side note, I was always a bit astounded by these decision transformers, by the whole approach of, of doing this as kind of this sequence modeling uh, with this fixed context size and these returns to go. And then I just essentially, I essentially say, well, I just want like a really high return, like just get me there. Um, it seems, it seems very special, <laughs> but it seems to work. I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on this, not necessarily related to your, your paper, but I do find it a very special model for, for reinforcement learning specifically. Yeah. Uh, like for sure like actually i was experimenting with like um trying some higher returns i don't think we included mm -hmm. it in, in the paper um but sometimes like especially during early stages of those training you could like get free returns almost um by just using like an artificially large uh returns um to go value and then suddenly like the model would get better at test <laughs> time um for example so yeah this i, I think it's uh, pretty amazing mm -hmm. honestly um maybe shows something about the power of transformers to sort of like gather sort of idea or ideas or like states um together and combine them yeah. in interesting ways um you i think we we can directly go a little like into the results uh because as i said the setup is is quite simple um now you test on two different on two different data sets so just to remind people we have uh the decision transformer which kind of serves as the, the baseline for what we're trying to do, that's sort of a same model with the same technique and the same inputs, just not pre-trained on language. And then there is this, am I pronouncing this correctly, Chibi T uh, model that is the same size, but has been pre-trained on language. And then there's GPT-2, which is a lot larger and obviously has been pre-trained on language. And then you have some, some baselines over here that are just for offline reinforcement learning. Now you can, you mentioned that your models consistently outperform or the language pre-trained models consistently outperform the decision transformer. But one of my worries here was that the standard deviations, especially in this experiment, they seem, they seem ginormous. Um, this, is there like, how can we be sure we're not just measuring, like it's better in the, in the bottom table right here, but on this DQN benchmark, how can we be sure we're not just measuring noise in these cases? I would say, um, well, a we can't <laughs> be sure, uh, but I would, I could say, I would say that like the trends mm. across experiments um, do tend to like point towards a certain direction, um, and also like this was like I'm uh, generally like a language person, uh, so. <laughs> When I was coming to RL and I was saying, oh, wow, we just changed the random seed. Um, and well, it changed by this much. It yep. was quite surprising to me. Um, but after like running experiments uh, many times, it seems the trends uh, were towards one direction. But I guess we could clarify that with some like mm -hmm. significance tests um, and yeah. things like that. I, I was, I was, uh, I think I was mentioning that, that the trend is in, in one direction. I think that's, that's much more convincing than, you know, anything being inside or outside of some standard deviation. What surprised me also is that uh, they're just, I think that's just a property of reinforcement learning as such. For example, this the Qbert environment, all of a sudden you see, for example, there are baselines that just fail. Like they, they just nothing, right? And then all, but all of a sudden, 
these models also aren't as good, but then this model is really good. Like, how do you... And also in the bottom table, I think a lot of times sort of which model is better than which other model is all over the place. Uh, sometimes these are better, sometimes these are better. Do you have an explanation of what's going on here? Why, why is there such a, let's say, a, a diversity of which approach wins in which circumstance? Uh, no, um, but I, w I would say uh, this is, is pretty interesting. Like, I feel, now again, I'm coming mm -hmm. from like a language perspective and I'm sure an RL person could give you like a much better explanation. Uh, but even when I was experimenting, I noticed like for some environments, the transformer tended to do like, like even early on, like the language pre-training tended to do like significantly better um, than the, say like the not language pre-trained models or even like the other models we have here. And this is just honestly, it's my intuition, but I feel like some of these techniques are like very um, specialized or maybe like very specialized to the sense that Maybe we don't know exactly what it is, but there are some properties of the environments that really go nicely with certain techniques, but then don't go nicely with certain others. And it's sort of like this random sort of puzzle um, game that's being played here. Uh, that was my intuition when I was like playing with it. I was like, oh, wow, this is this is pretty weird, actually. Um, but yeah, that's that's my intuition. Yeah, also even with like, if you look at like a GPT-2, a G GPT columns, I think, it sort of varies across the environment um, as well. So I think that sort of um, speaks to it. I, I also feel in reinforcement learning, a lot of times these algorithms are almost like designed with a problem in mind. Um, they, they are formulated as these general algorithms, but I think a lot of times people people go and they see, oh, what's the problem? I felt like this, you know, like go explore that the first algorithm that solved Montezuma's revenge, right? I looked at it and I was like, you just, you just like essentially hard coded the game into the algorithm. Even, even with their, they had two versions, even with their non, non human designed feature space. I'm, I was just like, you, you looked at, you know, you looked at what fails and you just hard coded a solution and you just, I'm trying to tell me, that this is a general, maybe something like this is happening here too, where people, they analyze what goes wrong in particular environments, and then they make an algorithm that would specifically address those problems. I find this to be, I find reinforcement learning to be an interesting field because of, because it seems like it's so not solved yet. Um, when we just look at your models, there is a, there is a discrepancy. First of all, uh, I've noticed that a lot of times the, the GPT-2 here doesn't significantly, sometimes it outperforms, but oftentimes it doesn't significantly outperform the much smaller model. Um, do you have an intuition as to maybe what's, you know, why don't we see a bigger benefit of large models here? It's, you say somewhere it's uh, over a hundred times larger. Uh, my intuition is this. So like, I think with like the certain papers, we've shown that like larger models can fit, um, like larger amounts of data better. Uh, maybe we can even extrapolate from those larger amounts of, um, data better. But if we think about what we're transferring here and it's not, again, it's not completely clear as of yet. Um, but if we assume that it's say maybe a smaller set of um features or properties rather than like language as a whole but maybe like some properties of language um right. then we can maybe say that okay if gbt and gpt2 despite their like very different sizes have learned sort of the same sort of maybe some element of the structure some notion of hierarchy um, or something like that and they're both learned like relatively equally so to say um then maybe size doesn't matter as much here given that uh we're fine-tuning on this same like relatively small um amount of like trajectory data um so that's that's what yep. i think is it called gbt because it sounds like gpt no uh okay. because <laughs> because well it was sort of related um uh, but gb like is means like sort of small mini okay. um, type of thing in Japanese. So it was like a, a joke um, because initially, so initially I was calling it 
GBLM actually. Uh, like when I was just referring to it because I needed a name, I couldn't write like the small pre-trained language model um, every time. Uh, and then Shane was like, you know what, let's make it GBT. Uh, so then that's that's what. It and became. you you mentioned that uh, Clip often it performs a little bit worse. And to note, you only you only use the text encoder or sorry the text uh, model from from Clip, which is an an, an um, a a sequence model like the other ones. And also there is iGPT, image GPT, that performs a lot worse. We can see it in this table. It just gets nowhere, right? And um, you had some hypotheses. Uh, do you want to maybe, uh, especially for, for the image GPT, um, do you, what, what is your hypothesis on why that is just kind of a failure case? Yeah, I think Utaro can answer this one because he was like master of running these experiments. Yeah, so, well, I think um, the image, stru like the structure that's in the image, like, so uh, image GPT is, is trained on basically like, uh, unrolled pixels um, mm -hmm. from like uh, from images. And I think the structure that's there in the image is like a really different um, from the structure that you've seen in language. Um, and it, in a way that like, like if you only have a static image, and if you only have like a pixels up there, mm -hmm. it's really hard to even like group, you know, it, which pixels group together into a discrete like up like unit of objects, like you know, discrete um um I guess discrete objects. So so that that um so first of all like GP IGP or image GPT um sort of like has to figure out that sort of like discreteness like um before um you can actually has the ability to transfer to these um. Uh, RL settings where it has more discrete structures. And, yeah. And <clears throat> so yeah, that's that's I think one of the main reasons why uh, the current version of image GPT that are trained on static images are not really uh, uh, good at transferring from from their domain to RL tasks. And, and I think if we can actually train uh, the sequential modeling or sequential models for like a video data, where um, uh, it'll be much easier to extract. Um, these, these like uh, discreteness because because if you only look at like, images or static images it's really it's and if you don't have any prior information about objects like it's really hard to extract you know objects only from static images but if you have a temporal dimension mm -hmm. if you have a video info, uh, information then it becomes much easier to extract those disc, uh, these, these um, objects because you know if you look at like a frame t and frame t plus one if you look at like a, a pixels the transform from, from t and t plus one um you know there is a difference in terms of perspectives yeah. so that sort of gives you a strong hint or strong cue regarding like which uh, which pixels group together mm. um and that's a really difference i think that will make eventually i think if you if have if we invest more into video um uh, research and if sequential modeling in the video domain, I think it'll be a really big difference. Um, that, that I think um, I'm, I'm really excited about like the, um, the, um, the future of a G, uh, like a st structural um, modeling that uses the video. And I, I, I'm excited to see how that uh, pre-trained model on the video will be transferred to like a different domains like RL in the future. Yeah. And, and possibly the um, sort of the direction into vector quantized models might also help a little bit because uh, not working on, as you say, it's really hard to even get what pixels belong together. But if we had more of token based approaches, maybe, you know, that could that could help decouple from the pixel level just just a bit. But that's, I guess that's just speculation uh, by me. And uh, one speculation I also had was with respect to um, your alignment modules right here. So you have these you have these linear projections that try to make the token embeddings of the RL problem as close as possible to the token embeddings that were seen during language pre-training, which makes sense because you kind of get to reuse, let's say the the paths that are already there for the language models. Uh, in your ablations, you show that these it also works without them, which was good for me to see because sometimes uh, it's little things like this that only make stuff work. Um, but 
in you know there is a difference between the distribution of language tokens which is usually like a zip distribution or or some sort of very heavy tailed uh but but you know sharp distribution um and image tokens which by construction tend to be more uh uniform um especially you know if you think like pixels but also the vector quantized models they are by design uniform um and with the rl problem could it be that it's it's also a matter of how the tokens are distributed um maybe the the rl tokens are again more more zipfian distributed and that's why it might fit a lot better or did you investigate the appropriateness of this uh, how the embeddings uh look like um so no we di- we didn't actually look into how the embeddings looked like that was like um we actually planned to do this because i think like personally i think it would be like really cool for example if we found out that it actually like these embeddings turned into like a sentence mm-hmm. um or something like that um but i do uh, agree with your hypothesis about maybe like how the tokens are distributed um or how frequent things are and i think this also sort of relates to sort of the structure in language or like this natural tendency to express things in a certain way and you may want to express certain concepts more often um than others and then there's also like sort of this conditional nature like maybe only if this concept appears which is represented by a certain set of tokens then you want to talk about this um which in a sense you could say mirrors uh RL uh or like just any like sort of activities that you would do um versus image modeling um personally i feel it's it's cool like as a topic but i also do feel it's very forced in a sense um it doesn't feel very natural to me if that makes sense do you feel that there are other disciplines that would transfer well to reinforcement learning i don't know if you've thought about this you 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 do include language and images so maybe you thought of even other things there are i don't know protein modeling genetic sequences there is sound and so on do you have any hypotheses or any plans to try out other modalities uh yes uh that we we do uh want to try other things I think like some interesting things like in addition to what you mentioned could even be like you could are this is a natural language but it's usually grouped in together with like the NLP community but like code um for example uh or even like testing out different languages simpler languages mm-hmm. um controlling for complexity uh really maybe even music uh I definitely think speech uh could be something else to try as well uh as you tell Luca to video I think there's so many things in sort of our uh i don't know about saying like daily life but there are a lot of things around us which sort of have like a natural sequential nature of things and it would be interesting to see if somehow uh especially in like a low data regime if these things are able to transfer to each other well and if there's like some maybe underlying principles uh or maybe like some like biases that are learned uh that correspond to like a large majority of sequential data or maybe certain types of sequential data and might also help us like group sequential data types um maybe learn learn more about how they relate to each other um and i think if we were able to do that then i think we'd be able to study this even more in depth and maybe build models based on those findings it's a pretty special world right that are all our models converge uh from all the different modalities that even allow us to do things like this i find it to be i find it to be a very special time uh because it would not have been possible if all the image models are convnet right and and uh all the all the speech models are somehow fourier transform some things um everything sort of converging to transformers uh, some people might not like it but it does enable sort of a bigger picture on on what even what it means to process data or you know if if you if you want to look at it like this uh, so these these attention plots right here i found to be very interesting now to be clear this you say this is on uh, hopper so this is one of these uh, gym tasks one of these continuous control tasks uh, is this one particular sample or is this like an aggregate over the data set or how how do we what is displayed here so this is an attention map given given a single trajectory a single one okay yeah so it's a, yeah single trajectory yeah. um but we can we can assume it's kind of representative of 
um, of kind of what happens in, in general. So I have made a bunch of observations here in my video, which some of which you also state in the paper, for example, this structure of, of three, like the models often looking back three steps back, which makes total sense because the decision transformer input comes in these tuples of three, right? And I'm, I'm gonna guess if I want to predict the next return to go, it's probably very related to the last one, especially if the reward is more sparse, I, I can just predict like the same number again, I'm going to be correct most of the time. And maybe the same with actions, uh, given that in the continuous control, frame by frame, I don't want to switch my action around too much, maybe, right? But <laughs> it's a pace to look mostly at these things. Um, what I found interesting is the image GPT had a sort of a, a, just a recency bias. Like it just seemed to look just two or three tokens uh, back in time, which I think supports very well what you claimed that image modeling might be different from language modeling in that, yeah, it might be that the image transformer just sort of looks at a local neighborhood and then just goes on, doesn't care too much about big structure. I don't know, it's just hypotheses. And then the, I think the most shady thing I said was when, with respect to the random, randomly initialized decision transformer. So this, this would be the baseline model, a transformer that from scratch is trained on this RL data. And I claimed what we can also see this sort of pattern of three, but much more strongly than in something like GPT-2, which does have, have a more diffuse attention. So here it's really super duper hard attention and I claimed that might, that might hinder the model from uh, learning proper connections between things in the future because it already kind of discards in the early layers everything that would connect uh, sort of a state and a reward. Is this, is this, does this come close to what you concluded or do you have like different insights into these attention maps or what's happening here? Uh, it's actually very, very close to uh, what we were thinking after looking at these attention maps. Mm -hmm. I think one thing actually after watching uh, your video that I didn't really notice until you pointed it out was like those yellow blocks of two. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually notice that they were actually two, um, uh, which I think is actually pretty cool uh, to see like maybe it, those, like for those ones it waits uh, like two of them together, maybe with different weightings. But overall, I think the interesting thing is that it's pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. um, like it doesn't necessarily change, like the patterns don't change significantly, um, which is sort of unlike language, for example, where you can see things like generally there is a recency bias to some degree, um, but you can see things like depending on the token uh, go like, like pretty far if it's like attending to similar tokens from far back. But then again, um, if you do think about it that way, you could argue like action uh, representations would probably be similar to action representations, state-to-state -state representations, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe actually the language models um, and even the randomly initialized model are mirroring that. Yeah, it's, I've, I found it to be very special how hard the attention patterns are is right here. But also there is always in distance of three rows, there is one that is just only looking at three steps back and six and nine and so on. And then the ones in between, there is one that has, as you say, that has two and one that even has like, it seems like almost it has three, but just one is a bit stronger. It'd be interesting to figure out which one is which. I I, I don't think I can tell from this thing, but yeah. So I think the one that's only looking at like three behind, yeah. um, if I remember correctly, is the returns to yeah. go. Um, and then the ones between that are, uh, the, say, the state representations yep. and then the action. Yeah, so the order is basically reward state okay, action. Okay. So, yeah, that yeah. makes makes a bit of sense. And we, I think the sort of the result right here, I think in the middle layer, it's, it's really nicely shown that something like GPT, it will start to focus on maybe kind of the important things in the past. Uh, it will select some of them um, to focus on and so no matter which time step it will kind of look back at maybe what it determines to be important states where as the randomly initialized one it will almost be like stuck 
in this mode of how it looks back. And my so my question here, and, and you can clearly see it in the last layer, in that in GPT-2, there's still this sort of focus and attention on maybe what, what it determines to be important things in the episode. And the other ones, they just have like a diffuse attention matrix. And my question would be, um, might it be possible that we could achieve the effect between, let's say, GPT-2 and, and the random one, like this this benefit through a much simpler procedure of just kind of regularizing, just saying like, you know, don't make your attention so hard. Like make, you know, just kind of keep your options open. Um, try to look back a bit further. Don't Don't try to be so sure yet. Is that... You know, is that something that's reasonable or do you think uh, there's reason to to discard that idea? I think it's I think it's reasonable to try. Um, but I still do feel that I think the if we do something like this, then maybe we again fall into the trap of what we were like talking about earlier is like this essentially like putting a band aid um, on like a very specific um problem per se but i think like the cool thing about transformers is uh they can learn a lot of different things so i think if if say like with a language model for example it's um it's an initialization you can fine tune it however you'd like to and i think it's more like flexible in that sense mm -hmm. um unless like say we were trying to tackle like a very specific issue then i think yeah it would be for sure something to try um like i think there's this recent paper for language modeling uh, by like Ophir Press uh, from UW and he they were looking at like say how they can bias uh, the like basically enforce a recency bias uh, towards a language model and that like improves like extrapolation towards lo longer sequences uh, and so on so I think in the in this case in language modeling it's like one specific task mm -hmm. um, that they're trying to solve but here if we like just talk about like offline reinforcement learning uh it's very very broad and i think um for example if you tried like ophir's trick in uh like say for pre-training bert or something like that now again this is just conjecture but i have a feeling it may not work as well um given like there's uh i would say a lesser like um there was also another paper by i don't know who it was by i think from dan chi chen's group at princeton recently um, about like uh, the masking rate in BERT models and things like that, and perplexity doesn't necessarily correlate yeah. uh, with downstream performance and so on. Um, so yeah, if we're tackling a specific task, I would say sure, but I think the one nice thing about the language model pre-training is how flexible it can be. Yeah, I was, um, I mean, I was the same. Uh, I'm probably, as you say, falling in the same trap that I criticized the field of reinforcement learning, say, you know, looking at one thing and saying, can I make up something that would that would just solve this one thing? Uh, yeah, and I think you know the difference is also to clip uh, show a little bit um, that it's not it's not just I can't just do um, any architecture or anything. There might actually be something to to language modeling. Uh, in this table, you specifically show that the the um, language model pre-trained ones converge faster. And I had one question here, and that was that is how different is this code base? Like how much how much of the difference in convergence can I attribute to um, you just being better at implementing stuff? And how much is really due to this these two things being pre-trained? Is it the same code base or did you re-implement or implement from scratch? I wish I could say I was like this amazing programmer that can make things so much more efficient, but no, unfortunately, we use the okay. same code base. So, yeah, so this is legit, um, so, legit yeah. speed up that, that is due to the, the pre-training. Nice. Um, I guess like one caveat that um, mentioned like about GPT-2 is that the faster training speed is due to like faster yep. conversions, um, even though like it's pretty, even though it's pretty big, but like say, um, when like you're doing like your rollouts um, and stuff like at inference time, it is definitely like slower as to be expected by a larger model. Yeah, that makes makes sense. I was also surprised because in reinforcement learning, usually the conventional wisdom is that it needs a lot of resources. And here you you mentioned something like you know you have a single v one hundred, 
And the time here is, I mean, even for the decision transformers, it's a couple of hours. It's not, it's not, I have to train on eight GPUs for a couple of days. I was just positively surprised by, by, uh, just sort of the, the requirements and this makes it more accessible. Yeah, I think that's the cool thing about offline RL. Um, you just, well, you just have to like say fit a certain set of trajectories. Um, and there have been like a lot of pretty efficient uh, models recently mm -hmm. as well. So yeah, I think it's when you get into the online setting then things get um, pretty like computationally expensive. Um, you also mentioned that context size doesn't really matter. In fact, more context seems to make stuff worse a little bit, right? At, like how significant this really is. Um, but do you have an idea here? Is that is it just because there's more noise? Um, or is there something wrong with the objective of the decision transformer? I think um, partially more noise. And two, I think because of, like, say, the tasks that are tested in gym, um, it's like you see a cheetah running, for example, or you have like this hopper, which is literally just yeah. hopping. Um, and that those, those motions are relatively repetitive. Um, like in Atari, for example, the context, uh, is I think quite a bit larger. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what the value was, but maybe like 50, uh, or maybe even a bit bigger than that. Um. Uh, but it's like, okay, for Atari, maybe you need more information because I guess like the actions that are being performed are more diverse. Um, and like sort of what can happen is more diverse. But then for these tasks, um, then maybe that much context is not as yeah. necessary. Um, th this is just my intuition. Maybe an RL person would be able to give a better idea of why. Um, so the, the last thing that, that was here very special is just the scaling behavior of these of these models namely the with the language model pre-training uh you could scale to much larger models do you have a feeling of how that continues like does it does it continue dropping off and just not giving you returns anymore or would it eventually also say you have like a model that's too large and uh it would drop in performance again versus a smaller model because my hypothesis was that language modeling you have infinite data essentially so you can never overfit on the pre-training um and therefore you know the there might never be really an opportunity to overfit on a a fine-tuning data set i don't know do you have an intuition i'm gonna guess you know maybe you didn't want to go up to too high parameter models uh yeah for like computational reasons um but uh for but i do generally agree with you like if we have i think if we have a decent initialization um like from the like language mm -hmm. modeling on say like like quote unquote like infinite data um then i think we should be able to arguably at least retain the same performance or get yep. like very close to it um th there perhaps there is a time like a point where it just gets too big um that it starts overfitting but i would say that would probably happen when it like not not close to the the parameters we tested for. Now you s oh sorry. Also, I think oh yeah sorry. So, so like one thing one good thing about like offline RL so you can also collect a lot more um, trajectory data from just running agents and and then train on offline data. So I think um, there's that perspective and in this in this figure um like uh, we can also train like a larger model and on larger uh, trajectory mm -hmm. data. And then if you have like a really good language initialization, then you can also try that sort of direction also, I think, in the future. Do you have an idea how that trades off? Like, would I rather, would I rather invest into pre-training my model on language data, or would I rather invest into gathering more offline RL data? Personally, I think if you're working with a fixed, like say, okay, say if we fix the amount of offline RL data, um, and say we're gonna like use that versus like designing like a better algorithm or something. I would say pre-train your language model. Um, but then again, as we see with the uh, like GPT versus GPT experiment, making it that much bigger, like sure it does help, like by by um, some margin, but it's not like that super significant. 
Um, so based on that, if we're going to assume that language transfer is only like a certain set of maybe limited uh, properties to uh, these RL tasks, then I would say, yeah, collect more um, RL data, I would say. You said at the beginning, you tried it out, you thought about it, it, it kind of all, it worked out of, or initially you got some promising results. Was there ever a thing that didn't work? Like, like the something in this project you tried and just didn't work at all, or it didn't work at first, uh, any sort of avenues you got stuck in? I would say that what was interesting uh, was that the cosine, um, the cosine loss that we added, uh, especially like towards uh, like later stages, everything sort of smooths up, but this more has to do with uh, how fast the model converges. So that, so actually maybe we should have ablated this, but the cosine uh, loss actually allows the model to converge much faster. And uh, one thing that was interesting is especially in the early stages that the cosine, so say we weren't using the cosine embedding loss initially, and we just had like GPT and GPT, a GPT. And GPT was like quite a bit lower um, than GPT, but then like say GPT without this extra loss, and then GPT with the loss, GPT yep. managed to catch up to GPT, which is like pretty mind blowing to me. Um, so like something like that was interesting. I wouldn't say like a hiccup because it actually worked like pretty well, um, like straight off the bat, but uh, it was pretty interesting to see. And another thing was um, without, say, like the positional embeddings, for example, um, I would, you would generate, like, I think we ablated this, but we would generally see like quite uh, lower uh, returns um, and things like that. So maybe even like the position transferred from language is also quite important. Um, is, there, is there anything else you'd like to get out about this paper? Uh, can people... Can people get into this themselves? Uh, your your code is it available? Yeah. Uh, so actually, it's in the fo footnote uh, right. of the first page. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, this stuff personally is super interesting uh, to see how we can transfer different sequence uh, modeling tasks to each other. It sort of unites it, like say one big big model that handles all the sequences uh, or something like that. Another thing that was actually pretty cool is with like the language modeling co-training uh, that we did. Um, when we did it, the language, like it was, the, we actually had a model that was able to language model and was able to handle trajectories at the same time. And like the language modeling performance didn't degrade significantly, um, which was also pretty cool um, because it means that we, can send, we essentially have the capacity even at a small scale um, to do both of these tasks at once. Um, and if we have like these models that are able to handle these separately, um, then it begs the question, okay, what can we do together? Um, like, can we model everything all together? Like, basically, I think with, um, what was it? The, like, say, like with multilingual pre-training um, that we have, it's sort of like until, I guess, Ember, or maybe like a, a few papers before that, we didn't really feed old uh, languages just together at once and see what happens. Um, and then on top of that, we see like, oh, we have like this zero shot transfer. Uh, whether it's truly zero shot is a different question, but still it's pretty cool. Um, and I think if we can sort of replicate that, uh, say we have um, like, I don't know, a remotely related language modeling, uh, like a domain and language. And if we fine tune on this domain and language, suddenly we can do like trajectory modeling on this domain that say has to do with what was talked about in language and things like that like it opens a new set of possibilities for maybe like generalization um and just like zero zero shot well <laughs> i don't like using that word but like uh that sort of performance in general like these new behaviors and stuff cool excellent well um michelle and, and yutaro thank you very much for being here and sharing sharing the projects i hope to see you again very soon um with more more modalities and and uh more i think this is i, I i'm still i'm still uh amazed sort of by by the results i find them really cool and yeah good luck in the future